Um, this is the schedule for this morning, and we all know uh, the time frames we were working around. So we're going to spend the next hour or so down here, uh, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what the GP obstetrician is, what we do, where we work, and why we love our job so much, and why we think that you might feel that we're going to in the country. Um, after that, we'll um, all break off into groups. So. There's about 50 of you here, and there's six stations. So it's about eight or nine people in each group, um, more or less. I mean, I'm not sure if you're going to turn up today. You can sleep out there. So, um, but you can go with your friends, and um, um, and then we'll just basically uh, allocate you as you go up the stairs to a room, and then we'll just basically rotate around um, every 30 minutes. So um, we'll have one of the Cinefix um, members will be timing committees, be timing the stations and we'll have them you know, come and knock on the door and have them this morning. Um, at that, we'll probably be about 11 o'clock actually, because it's going to be two 30 minutes uh, workshops. We will have morning tea and that's going to be back down here. Um, and you can have a chat to um, any of the facilitators here um, about any questions that you might have. We can obviously just chat amongst yourselves. And then we'll um, recommence again about 11.30. Um, and again, we'll just finish off the remaining four stations. Um, then we'll come back down here at the end of that. There'll be lunch. Um, and we've also got an evaluation form that we'd really appreciate if you don't mind filling that out. We we'll, um, take all your feedback on board. And every year we do refine the program depending on yeah, what you guys think we should do. So, um, yeah, and then obviously there are other people here um, that you can speak to, there's resources around, so um, like I said, just ask um, if you need any help with anything. So these are the stations that we'll be covering this morning, so um, we've got postpartum hemorrhage with Emma Smith, normal vaginal delivery with um, Beck Leningham, pelvic examination with myself, um, shoulder dystocia with Siobhan Howard, uh, neonatal resuscitation with Ralph Chapman, I think Ralph's just on a video conference at the moment, so hopefully he'll pop in a little bit later. And um, Carly Roxford's going to come up into the medical delivery. So lots of opportunities to get your hands dirty, literally. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so now I'll just um, start off by uh, telling you about what I do and what we all do. Um, so just as a show of hands, who has heard of the GP obstetrician before today? Very good. That is very reassuring. Um, so, but we um, we do provide a really valuable service um, in Western Australia, um, both in the country and in the city. Um, we generally manage lower risk obstetric patients, um, and we provide antenatal care care in our clinics. Um, and some of us provide intrapartum care, obviously during um, labour and birth. Um, we also do that in both public and private hospitals. Some of us do extra training so that we can do cesarean sections, so I think um, that's something that a lot of people don't know. And we also do do um, some office-based gynaecological um, procedures as well, such as putting in IUDs. Some GP obstetricians are even train up to do colposcopies, so it's quite a broad scope of practice. So in terms of how we differ from our um, <coughs> colleagues, we, act, we work in the primary care setting. Uh, but we also do work in the hospital setting as well. So the beauty of that is that we can offer continuity of care, which I think um, as, a, as a GP obstetrician, that's what I really love about my job. And I, I'd say my colleagues at the back here as well. So we can look after women from before they even fall pregnant, right through to when they come in with their baby and their children after their pregnancy. Um, so that, um, yeah, that brings us a lot of joy. Uh, and I think the women really appreciate that as well. Um, we can provide shared care if the women have got a higher risk pregnancy um, and so uh, even though they may deliver in the hospital with a specialist looking after them, we can still provide antenatal or postnatal care and again um, offer uh, the primary care aspects that are still needed in pregnancy for the women. We generally do less gynaecological surgery than <coughs> specialists um, uh, and that's just, um, just because we don't get trained to do those sort of um, more specialist procedures. So where can you work as a GP obstetrician? Well, we work across the entire state, from Kununurra to Esperance to Kalgoorlie and, and most places in the world. Um, there are quite a number of GP obstetricians working in the metro and outer metro areas, so I've just listed all the hospitals there where we um, do work. 
Um, and the models of, um, of care and the rostering does vary from service, health service to health service. And I will talk a little bit about that in a minute. So to become a GP obstetrician, um, there's quite a clearly defined pathway now. For a long time, it felt a little bit confusing, but we've worked really, really hard with all of the um, stakeholders involved in GP obstetric training to ensure that it's as clear as possible for you guys. There is always some flexibility, um, but it's a pretty clear pathway for these days. So once you've finished your medical school training and you've done your internship, and you think that you might like to do um, GP obstetrics, um, it's often a good idea to um, apply to a hospital where you can do a, a your drags of. Um, and so there's quite a number of hospitals that do that. King Edward is still regarded as the, as the mothership. Um, and certainly they're very um, familiar with training GP obstetricians. But there are other hospitals such as Ben Stanley and Midlands um, where you can get resident physicians and train and do your own transcom training. There's also um, rural hospitals where you can, um, can do training that will contribute towards your transcom, so um, Geraldton and Bunbury. The main issues with the smaller hospitals is that um, often the numbers uh, can be a bit tricky. So even though you might do most of your training in a rural hospital, you may need to come back for a short period of time just to top up your log book um, at somewhere like King Edward. And we're very fortunate, we've got excellent relationships with um, the doctors at uh, King Edward and Cars of Domain. You probably hear a lot of if you go down this path. She's very, very supportive of training GP obstetricians and she will go above and beyond. If you're in rural, really interested um, training who's looking at doing GP obstetrics, she will um, go above and beyond to make sure that you get um, the position that you need back in, at King Edward to get the skills that you need. Um, you will need to do a certificate, oh, a, a diploma um, for the Dranska. Um, and there's two different types, the basic and advanced. The basic essentially um, means that you, you do all of the skills um, that you need to look after um, vaginal birth, um, but you don't train to do the cesarean section. An advanced transcom, you do do um, cesarean section, and you also do some other more um, uh, things like ultrasound and other kind of more complex gynecological um, surgery. So, yeah, and it's a um, minimum six months for your trans basic and 12 months for, for advanced, but often um, trainees do tend to hang around a little bit longer for the advanced just to get the skills and the confidence that you need. Because if you're going out to work autonomously in the country, it can be a little bit scary. We have got excellent um, supports from both GP obstetricians and specialists in the country, so you're never sort of thrown out there on your own completely. Um, but I think people do appreciate having, a, having that sort of really strong foundation. And um, Siobhan will be able to talk about that, um, and Carly um, in a little bit more detail, because they've both got advanced drugs. Um, so these are all of the places where you could potentially get um, experience that will contribute towards your um, Dranscom. So all of these hospitals have got accreditation to do um, Dranscom training. Um, they don't always have positions available because obviously if you're going to have a training position you need a funded position. Um, and I'm sure most of you are aware that that's just a constant battle sometimes. The health budget's always under the pump. But we do do our very best um, to make positions, training positions available in the sites where people want to go if we can. Um, so I think you know, that just reflects the diversity of experience that you can get from your training. <coughs> now I'm going to hand over to Erica in a minute, who's here from Lancet, and she's going to talk in a little bit more detail about GP training. But I just wanted to mention that obviously if you're going to be a GP obstetrician, you do need to do GP training as well as <laughs> a transcom. Um, and the timing of it can be very flexible. So, for example, um, when I did my training, I actually started off um, as a, a GP registrar, um, and I did two six-month rotations, and then I came back to King Edward and did six months, um, completed my basic, and then went back to GP training to finish off my training. During that time, I did a, a GP obstetrics mentoring program, which we'll talk about a little bit more in a sec. Um, and then I, you know, finished my GP, sat my exams, finished my GP training, and my Dranscom exam, and then I was a GP obstetrician. Other people who, I'm sure that um, the guys at the back will be able to tell you their story, um, started off at King Edward, got all their skills, and then started out in GP training. And then we've got others who actually have been GPs for quite some time and decided, actually, no, I'd really like to do obstetrics, and have come back and done their training 
as a, as a fellow GP, um, and then gone back out and used their skills um, in, their, in the rural town where they're from. So it's a really flexible um, training pathway, as I mentioned before, um, and it's really up to you and your sort of life circumstances as to how you choose to, um, to make that training journey. Um, so, the GP Obstetrics Mentoring Program, we've got the two lovely ladies from Rural Health West up the back, Susie and Laura, so if you've got <coughs> more questions about this, please go and talk to them, but I'm a huge advocate for this program because I was a mentee and now I'm the mentor. So, what the, um, these pro this program is all about is supporting um, newly graduated trans uh, graduates to transition from that very supportive tertiary hospital kind of um, environment into the very autonomous, sometimes feels a bit unsupported, um, GP environment. Um, and so what happens is, uh, once you've decided where you want to go and do your GP training and use your um, obstetric skills, you identify a mentor. And that's why it's good to make contact with Susie and Laura early because they can help you find an appropriate mentor in the town where you want to be. And essentially both of you get some funds um, so that you can, um, so that the, G, the mentor feels like they're being adequately remunerated for being your backup, and so that you can also access um, extra training and upskilling and or, um, travel, all that sort of thing. Um, and so that program is six months long if you're an urban GP um, trainee or 12 months if you're out in the country. Um, and, it's, and that basically um, you can, if you're on call and you have a difficult case or you just need to find something, find someone, you can call up your mentor, have a phone conversation, they might come in and give you a hand or just stand back and watch and just give you some peace of mind that you, you know, you've got someone there if you need them. Um, and it's just a really um, supportive way of um, transitioning from, like I said, from being very, very supported um, in the hospital environment to um, having less um, GP small hospital environment. So yeah, we have five at the moment. The, obviously, it's a um, year-to-year funding cycle, so um, we do we do have to wait each year to know whether we've got you know funds. But um, we've been really fortunate. These have been going on now. I was a mentee in two thousand and seven, so we're now two thousand eighteen. So we've been going for eleven years now, which is it's a fabulous. And it, we're really seeing. Um, the uh, impact of this program. Um, myself and Susie and a few others have been evaluating the program um, and we've actually got quite a bit of data that supports um, the fact that we are making a really positive impact to people's confidence levels and retention as well. So we're keeping GP obstetricians out in the country where they are needed, which is fantastic. So, um, all right, Erica, I'll hand over to you now. And, um,